I'm Julie Zenner along with Greg Grell and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. The City of Superior is considering building a fiber network for homes and businesses. We'll find out more about this innovative public infrastructure proposal. A major concert is being planned as part of the 100th anniversary of the Duluth lynchings. We'll talk with organizers from the Clayton Jackson McGee Memorial Committee. And Lake Assault Bolts and Superior headlines this week's business news from Business North. It's all coming up next on Almanac North. and welcome to Almanac North. Thanks for watching. Almanac North producer Greg Grell is here this week filling in for Danny. Good to see you here. Thank you, Julie. We should mention too, we taped this show on Wednesday afternoon due to our, due to our March membership drive. Which is always a fan favorite here at uh, <laughs> Channel 8, so we hope you'll be watching and uh, we hope that you enjoy tonight's show too. We have a good show, Greg. Well, thanks very much, Julie, and uh, welcome everybody. The importance of reliable internet access can't be overemphasized in the 21st century. The City of Superior is considering building its own broadband fiber network, a municipal infrastructure project that would provide robust connectivity. Joining us to talk more about this idea is Jim Payne, the mayor of the City of Superior, and Tyler Elm is a Superior City Councilor who brought the I idea to the city, and thanks to both of you for being here today. And uh, Mayor Payne, tell us just how would this work? How, how would this be accomplished? Well, it's relatively complex and it's a big change. Uh, mm -hmm. What would happen is the city would uh, create the infrastructure of the internet, the actual physical wires, if you will, is a simplistic way of describing it. And we would own that part, but the internet would be brought to you by the private market, the same as it is now. So right now the private sector does both. We're gonna take half of that. The same way uh, uh, we in most cities handle almost every other utility, whether that's water or sewer or public roads, we're gonna, uh, uh, recognize that the internet is a public utility and we're going to provide the infrastructure for it while the private sector do the rest. You talk like it's a done deal. Oh no, this is nowhere <laughs> close to a done deal. Uh, this is uh, going to take quite a bit of work because it's a pretty profound shift. This part of uh, this utility, this public service is very much uh, regulated to the private sector right now. Mm -hmm. um, Councillor, what's the current state of internet access in Superior? Is there a lack of providers? Um, how does it compare to the rest of the region? I think uh, one of the best ways to describe this is the, the inequality of the dollar per megabit per second. Mm -hmm. So you have a speedometer on your car, you see how fast you're going. The uh, same thing is with the internet. Uh, we're getting about 100 megabits a second and you're paying about 70, 80 dollars a month. So with uh, this proposal, you'd be able to save about 30 percent and uh, go up to about 1,000 by 1,000 megabits too. So it's symmetrical up and down. So that's, that's one of the big benefits here is to be able to use this as a tool of economic development education uh, it goes on to health care this 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 connects everything together mm -hmm. and Councillor Elm uh, where did this idea come from you you're, you work in the in the industry you uh, you own a computer uh, company uh, sure. how did you find out about this or where did this idea come from um, always looking to be innovative and do things differently. Um, uh, my company is not an internet provider, so we're once removed from that. But uh, just seeing other parts of the country paying $40, $50 a month for that kind of speed. And fiber has the ability to actually give much faster speeds too. I mean, as we see technology uh, curb and, and become more innovative and more tools with automation and uh, virtual reality and so on, uh, this will be a huge benefit to, to future-proof our city. Mm -hmm. Mayor, as you were describing the system that you envisioned before, it sounded like there was quite a bit of infrastructure that would have to be created. Um, what would the cost be for that and where would the money come from? 
Well, it's hard to say what the cost would be right now, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it would come from two sources. Part would be the public would invest in uh, the, those parts of the system that belong to the city. Uh, and so we would build that like any other infrastructure through some uh, capital plans. Um, but part of it is still private homeowners that want to enter into the system are going to pay for their part of that. A, a good comparison is our sewer lines. The public owns most sewer lines, but if you want to connect to that, that part that's on your property, that's yours. You will build that and maintain it. Mm -hmm. Sewer lines so uh, water, gas, things like that. Um, what you typically think of as a, a municipal utility has somewhat of a captive audience. You know, they're, they're required. It's the only place that they can get those services. Uh, would residents of Superior be able to still access from outside providers or would all of the internet services within the city of Superior be funneled through this system? So, of course, especially in the beginning, uh, the private sector is still going to uh, be a major player in this. They're the only player in it right now. Uh, I, I look at this as the same transition that we went through when we went to a public utility process like sewer, where almost everybody handled that problem privately uh, until it became a public utility. And we're going through the same recognition process that this uh, access to internet is so important that the public has to play a role, government has to play a role, a role in making sure that everybody has equal and affordable access to it. Mm -hmm. Now on your uh, website, you've got a, a descriptive video kind of explaining how it would work and I thought it might be helpful to show some of that. So let's take a look at that portion of that video right now. The problem with our current broadband system is that large internet service providers control the digital roads and access to those roads. They use this control to block competition and keep prices inflated. We understand that broadband network infrastructure is essential to everyday life and that open networks lead to innovation, increased competition, lower prices, and faster network speeds. We're making broadband infrastructure a public utility, just like your home's water, sewer, and power connections. But we will not compete with the private sector by providing internet services over this infrastructure. Those who participate will select from a list of ISPs and internet plans based upon their needs. But here's the best part. Subscribers can switch providers and plans in less than 60 seconds, as easy as shopping online. By providing the digital infrastructure as a utility and creating real competition between ISPs, our goal is to drive down the total cost for internet access by at least 30%. So uh, this video was made, it's obvious it was made kind of as, in a generic way. So I'm assuming other communities have tried this, Councilor Elm? Yes, uh, Ammon, Idaho is uh, the example city that has done this and they're doing it zone by zone. and. Um, one of the neat things to think about with this is, uh, as the roads, um, if you were to compare uh, UPS or FedEx, uh, if they had to build their own roads, how expensive shipping would be. So the idea is to have this single uh, high bandwidth infrastructure in place where we it's an open market, open access for ISPs, internet service providers to, to use that infrastructure and uh, make it accessible. Mm -hmm. In some ways, it sounds a, a little bit like uh, the healthcare exchanges, you know, where where you have um, providers that come into this online marketplace that's somewhat sanctioned by by in this case the city, and they do their purchasing um, and ordering through that. How do you get the ISPs to to participate in something like this? What's the advantage to them to to essentially buy into this system? Uh, because it's an open market. And so mm -hmm. it's roughly as difficult as getting people to drive on our roads. Uh, when you make something that everybody can use equitably, everybody uses it. And so right now the barrier to entry for a new company to come into a place like Superior is they have to provide their own infrastructure. Other companies generally aren't very uh, cooperative in letting other people use their infrastructure. We're going to provide it and then any internet company will be able to, uh, to use that and sell internet service to people in Superior. Mm -hmm. And Councillor Elm, uh, does lack of broadband access right now, is, do you think it's impacting the city, both businesses and res residents? Do you see a real need for this? Uh, absolutely. Um, not only uh, access in certain areas, but just the inequality of the speed. You know, I mean, that if you are a business um, and and, and every aspect of business is, is needs it, you know, whether it's the telephone aspect of communication with the customer, point of sales, tr credit card transactions. Um, even even uh, in, in the entertainment realm, you have 4K television, you know, that's becoming um, 
more important to have that kind of bandwidth available too. So I mean, this this impacts impacts a lot. Information technology um, changes so rapidly these days. There's so much competition in the the broadband market. Um, government generally isn't known to be real nimble. How do you respond as a as a government to to those changes and make sure that um, you don't wind up with with technology that's obsolete a couple of years down the road and maybe taxpayers are stuck with some expensive uh, fiber optic albatross that they still have to pay for. The, the capacity uh, uh, per second on fiber can be 25 million megabits per second. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we're not even close to that. The end units can be replaced. So once that infrastructure is in place, you would be replacing the two different end units uh, as technology advances. So there isn't anything uh, faster out there at the moment. And at the current model is being using, whether it's existing tel telephone lines or existing coax cable, and what what's being done right now is different hubs are getting closer and closer to the homes to try to uh, get the most out of the inf existing infrastructure. But with this proposal, getting fiber to the home would be able to give that near unlimited uh, c capacity in comparison. Uh, on, the, on the website, if you go to connectsuperior.com, you can see a visual graph what uh, we're currently getting now to what, what it could be. So I don't see uh, a faster method at the moment. And, and we do adapt all the time. I know that that's kind of a conception of government that, <laughs> that we're a slow <laughs> Maybe moving I was a organization. Harsh. <laughs> no, uh, uh, but it's part of what we do. Public infrastructure, uh -huh. we're changing all the time. We yeah. really have to make new investments every single year in infrastructure. We're growing and we're changing and adapting to current needs. That's what government should do, provide mm -hmm. fair and equal access to everybody. Mm -hmm. Now we have just less than a minute left, but I'm wondering, I know this is a brand new announcement. We're recording today on Wednesday. Have you heard much from the public so far since you just kind of announced this this week? It's a lot of questions for sure. Uh, it's, a, it's a big proposal. Um, there's going to be people that are nervous about it. On the whole though, people recognize the need for high-speed internet and they recognize that the system that they have right now doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. And you, you do have a survey online that yes. you're that you're trying to collect some information from people where do people find that and what are the kinds of questions that you're asking uh, the websites connect superior uh -huh. and uh, it's a three-minute survey it's where do you live what kind of speeds are you getting there's a speed test option to actually see what you're getting and then how much are you paying per month and are, are you satisfied with the service uh, is it uh, do you feel it's fair is it excellent and we're going to collect that information to see what spots of the city are most interested and what they're paying and what they're getting. All right, All right. well, thank you. We'll be watching to see what happens. Mayor Payne, Councillor Elm, thank you very much for thank being you. here. Thank you both. Happy Friday. All yeah. right, thank you. Thank you.
A concert titled, And They Lynched Him on a Tree, will be held at the Mitchell Auditorium at the College of St. Scholastica on March 8th. The concert is part of events organized by the Clayton Jackson McGee 2020 Planning Committee to recognize the 100-year anniversary of the Duluth lynching. The concert will feature the world premiere of Rudy Peralt's We Three Kings, commissioned by the committee. Also featured will be works by African-American composer William Grant Still. Well, here to tell us more is Julia Cheng, the lead organizer of the concert and member of the 2020 Planning Committee. And Jordan Moses has been the driving force behind all of the events. He is the CG, CJM 2020 event planner. And welcome, and thanks to both of you for being here. Thanks for having, having us. us. Uh, we'll get to the concert in just a moment, but Julia, for those who may not be familiar with this sad event in Duluth's history, could you maybe just tell us the story of what happened that um, will be remembered this year? Well, in June of 1920, the uh, John Robinson Circus came to Duluth, and during their stay here, uh, two young people ended up accusing uh, circus workers of attack and rape. So after the circus had packed up, and you know they were on a train on their way out of town, uh, the train was actually stopped, and uh, the and police officers took um, all of the black circus workers off of the train. Uh, the young people did, you know, follow, followed directions and, and identified uh, six young men who were then taken to the city jail on East Superior Street. Uh, there were other people in West Duluth who uh, fomented uh, a lynch mob. Uh, one person in particular uh, had a truck and, you know, drove up, up and down uh, Superior Street calling for a mob to form. So on the evening of June 15th, a mob of probably 10,000 people formed outside the jail in downtown Duluth. Um, they used bricks, axes, uh, uh, I, I don't know, hatches, and they, they, they broke through the walls of the jail. Uh, they held a kangaroo court trial and they dragged three of the young men up Second Avenue East to the intersection with First Street, and they hang them from a light pole. Um, this was a heinous event, and um, even though it made the national news, uh, for many years the, the knowledge about this was suppressed in the Duluth community at large, although the African American community was very, very aware of that. So um, in about, uh, the 1990s, members of the Duluth community formed a committee to bring recognition, to bring this truth to light. And that committee um, helped um, uh, build the monument that now stands at, at, at that intersection. And the, the Clayton Jackson McGee Memorial was dedicated in 2003, which was only 17 years ago. So that was you know, pretty much within um, a reasonable time frame. You know, 17 years is not that long. and and I'm, I'm in the second generation of, of uh, board members. The building committee formed the nonprofit 501c3, and you know, as soon as that, uh, as soon as the memorial was dedicated in, in 2003, we said, you know, 17 years from now, 2020 is mm -hmm. the centennial, and and we need to prepare. We need to recognize um, that very, very significant milestone, and 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 here we are. Mm -hmm. Now, Jordan, you've. Uh, kind of been spearheading this whole effort. Uh, but are the repercussions, I mean, it's 100 years ago, seems like a long time ago, but I mean, it's so fresh in our memories now, especially when we're bringing it back on the 100th anniversary. Are, have we really dealt with the repercussions here in Duluth? Um, well, I don't think so. I think one of the pieces that folks need to understand about these, these lynchings, the lynchings in Duluth is, they weren't some random act of violence, right? They are uh, a tactic, a tactic that was used all over the country to, uh, incite fear and to control populations. And that tactic is born out of a place of hatred, white supremacy, um, and, and this culture of violence. And so although things have, have shifted and changed over time, uh, we still are dealing with um, racism, white supremacy, violence, dehumanization. Uh, you know, there are folks on this planet who were alive 
when these lynchings occurred. There are folks in our community that know folks that were there and have heard stories from folks who were there or who, or who were in our city at the time. And so uh, we have to continue as a community to, to have these conversations and explore the history and how that history ripples through time and how it affects us 100 years later. Let's talk about the, the concert that's coming up. That's how you're going to kick off the 100 days leading up to the actual anniversary. Um, it's being billed as a concert of healing and atonement. What makes the concert so unique? That's a great question for Julia. All right, yeah. I'll pass it to Julia. <laughs> okay. um, well, the, the genesis of this concert was uh, at my attending a an Arrowhead Chorale performance of the St. Matthew Passion back in 2015. Um, it was, you know, uh, offered during the Lenten season, and what really struck me immediately were the parallels between this mob lynching in Palestine 2,000 years ago, according to tradition, and what happened here. And I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if we staged the St. Matthew Passion in recognition of the 100th anniversary? And that turned out to be probably too much to do because it's a very long piece of music. But um, we, we stayed with the idea and, and chose different pieces of music. So the concert is a concert of healing and atonement. And I like to say that people don't really remember very well what they hear, but they always remember how they feel. And my goal in this project was to um, create a, an orchestra and a chorus drawn from across the community. And these people would offer music in, uh, in, in ways that would recognize what happened, happened to these three young men. And so we chose a symphony by um, the African-American composer William Grant Still. Uh, we feel that we, we needed to recognize artists whose careers have, have been impacted by, by racism and, and, and white supremacy, and, and Grant Still was, was one of them. Uh, we are performing the symphony number two. We're also performing Grant Still's oratorio, and they lynched him on a tree. Uh, it was his setting t of a poem uh, by Catherine Chapin. Uh, it's, uh, a story of a, of a man who was lynched. And of course, we don't see this on stage. But, you know, we've been working on, on, this, on this piece for several weeks now, the, the chorus has. Uh, the orchestra starts rehearsals next week. And last week, we, we did the first complete run through uh, of the chorus. And, and even though it was raw and it needs more rehearsal, I just felt chills from hearing this. And, and I think that the people who are singing, the people who are playing, they're gonna remember how they felt learning these pieces. They're gonna remember how they felt performing. They, they will feel something in their heart, the terror and the grief that these young men went through. And this will, in, in, in our, as one of our goals is that people go through this experience transformed with resolve to, to do better you know, to undo racism, to make change in our community. Um, we are all still gonna be here. Uh, we're gonna, we, we, will, we will take what we, what we learned and felt and experienced in, in, in this concert and carry it on in our lives. Unfortunately, we're just about out of time here, but uh, Jordan, I just wanted to mention too that uh, people need to go online to register for a ticket. Can yes, you tell indeed. people to do that? We'll have a graphic up at the end For as well. sure, yeah. It's cjm2020.org. Um, there is a button right under the event title and photograph, and you can register. It's free to register, but it likely will be sold out, so we highly recommend registering. And it's March 8th, coming up on March 8th. Thank you for being here. Yes, thank you. Thank you.
Let's turn now to the business news from the folks at Business North. Lake Assault Bolts and Superior will deliver two 35-foot patrol vessels to the U.S. Army by the end of March. The identical craft are 35 feet long with 10-foot beams. The V-Hall vessels are powered by three 250-horsepower outboard motors, can reach a speed of up to 45 knots. Each boat features a fully enclosed pilot house with sleeping cabin, also has seating for 10 people. They also have dual weapon mounts able to hold 50 caliber machine guns. Direct passenger air service between Duluth and Denver did not receive federal funds local airport officials wanted. An application for the money was not selected by the U.S. Department of Transportation, airport officials revealed on Tuesday. The local request was among 57 grant applications submitted by communities in 30 states, but only 18 grants were awarded. Another grant cycle will begin this spring and the request will be resubmitted. Airport officials say demand has been voiced for the route and they have received support from regional partners. Another long-term local executive has announced retirement plans following a flurry of similar recent announcements. Christine Gretel Seitz will retire from her position as executive and artistic director of the Duluth Playhouse at the end of September. Seitz has led the Playhouse since January of 2000 and under her leadership it's grown from a single stage to a three venue theatrical organization. A new artistic director starts working at the Playhouse in May. Meanwhile, a nationwide search is being conducted to fill the position of executive director. For more on these and other stories, visit businessnorth.com. You'll never miss a topic if you keep up with Almanac North on our social media channels. You will find us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And visit the WDSE website for program updates, station news, and more about upcoming public events. And a program note for viewers, Almanac North will be off the next two weeks during WDSE's March membership drive. We'll be back with a new show on Friday, March 20th. And Greg, I, I'm sure that there will be plenty of news for us to catch up on by then. Yeah, and it'll be spring by then, too, so that'll be nice. That's right. <laughs> spring, it's coming. For Greg and the entire crew here at Almanac North, I'm Julie Zenner. Have a great weekend. We'll see you in three weeks.